respected judges and my dear friends. So here I am to present a paper that uh, during our practice it has been now seeing a trend, rising trend in doing the laparoscopy as a mode of in, uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnosis in infertility. So I'll be presenting my paper on should laparoscopy totally replace hysterosalpingography in the management of in female infertility. Uh, the aims and objectives were to evaluate the efficacy in, of HSG in comparison with laparoscopy in the evaluation of treatment of infertile patients and compare the pregnancy rates after each modality. The, this study was, so this was a retrospective comparative study which was done uh, for the period of two years uh, from Jan 2017 to December 2018 and uh, it was conducted at our hospital, Patanka Fertility Solutions in Pune. The, all the patients attending the um, OPD of, uh, infertility OPD of Patanka Fertility Solutions, uh, they were included and the female partners ranging from 20 to 42 years of age were included in the study and other causes of infertility were ruled out like ovulatory dysfunction, abnormal semen parameters and hyperprolactinemia or poor ovarian reserve. The patients who were advised to undergo uh, laparoscopy or HSG, they were posted for the procedures in the immediate postmenstrual period depending upon the parameters such as age, previous treatment, type of infertility, presence uh, or absence of other pelvic pathology or any history suggestive of so and depending upon the results, the further course of treatment were decided. The total number of patients who underwent HSG were 318 and those who underwent uh, laparoscopy was 202. So the findings uh, were out of 318 patients, uh, 132, that is 42 percent patients conceived and eight, uh, out in the laparoscopy group 87, that is 43 percent patients conceived. Out of the conceived patients, uh, 38 patients showed spontaneous conception that is immediately after the HSG was done and laparoscopy uh, in the laparoscopy group there were 9 percent that is 8 patients who conceived. Now the 94 patients required treatment in the group of HSG and laparoscopy in group of laparoscopy 79 patients uh, needed treatment and those who underwent treatment 40 patients uh, conceived after just the timely intercourse, that is ovulation induction and planned uh, intercourse, and 54 patients, that is 57% needed IUI. In the laparoscopy group, this was only 13 versus 41. Of course, we don't do uh, IVF in patients who underwent HSG before we undergo laparoscopy, so 25 patients in the laparoscopy group needed the IVF. Now, according to the age distribution, most of the patients fell in the age group of 26 to 30, Although there were patients who were elderly, but these were the patients who had secondary infertility who have had previous children. Now if we compare the results of the patients uh, in HSG versus the laparoscopy group, there was uh, the patients who conceived uh, did not show very much uh, uh, sign uh, the difference, significant difference, so there could not be any difference. But in the spontaneous conception group and conception of after TIC and IUI, so uh, the p-value uh, indicates that the conception of the TIC may be level of significantly higher for HSD than that of laparoscopy. And uh, then there was a group wherein we found total uh, tubal block in HSD and these were the patients who were immediately posted for uh, laparoscopy. There were 21 um, patients who, ha who showed uh, bilateral tubal block and 8 patients had false positive. Actual tubal block was found in 13 patients which were two, out of which 2 needed cannulation and 11 patients had unilateral uh, tubal block. Now after undergoing certain uh, level of treatment uh, after HSG like uh, timely intercourse and IUI, we also had 120 patients who needed the laparoscopy because they did not conceive and 70 patients were found un uh, of unexplained infertility because all the findings were normal in those patients and other findings, other pathologies were found in the rest of the patients. So while well, discussion, I would say that there were two studies I found wherein the uh, 
these, this type of study was conducted, but the cohort was little less, that is 75 patients and uh, in another group, MITI and all, they studied 50 patients and then that concluded that uh, there, then there was one more uh, study of Jain and colleagues, that is 70 who underwent HSG and they found that HSG has a high sensitivity and a good specificity. And so uh, they all concluded that HSG is safe, non-invasive and cost-effective treatment in the investigation. From our uh, observations and uh, uh, findings, we can conclude that the, although there is an increasing trend to do laparoscopy as a primary procedure in the pre patients of infertility, uh, it is evident from our results that there were considerable patients who conceived just after HSD and the cohort who underwent HSD were much bigger than the uh, ones who underwent uh, laparoscopy. Of course, in the laparoscopy group also, there were patients who had already undergone HSD and the pregnancy rates after both modalities were comparable. So, uh, f um, According to this uh, study, we just found that HSD still plays a role as a less invasive cost-effective and easily available diagnostic modality of the treatment with a shorter learning because we don't need higher setup, we don't have to have uh, more skills to do HSG and still we can pass on the benefit to the patients, especially in the patients who are not so affording and also in so many patients who may not require the operative procedure at all. Thank you so much. As you think laparoscopy is a more invasive procedure, um, why don't you try office hysteroscopy instead of HSG so that you can um, treat any pathologies at the same time? Office hysteroscopy by, uh, followed by sonosalpingography. Yeah, we did not, I mean, we tried it uh, long back, but we did not have very satisfactory results. Plus, the uterine anomalies can be better detected with HSG. Also, we will have uh, documentation. So, it is not only for the, as a primary investigation, not only for the tubal factor, but uterine anomalies also we can better detect it. We can better detect with the help of HSGs than the sonosalpingography. Uh, first of all, nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I just want to know why you felt like doing this study. Uh, there are two different modalities. HSG is used only for diagnosis, while laparoscopy can be used as a treatment modality also. Uh, I uh, felt like doing this study because uh, uh, so many patients who come from other uh, uh, doctors also, they were always offered laparoscopy as a first line, which uh, I felt it is not necessary. Secondly, when we do the um, investigations and when we offer HSG as the first modality, we found that there were so many patients who conceived spontaneously. So there could be just a clogging of the tube and with the force of dye, they get cleared or and that 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 is all that is required maybe. So why to subject, I mean, it is 10 times more, the cost of laparoscopy is 10 times more than the cost of, of course laparoscopy has its role, it, it, it is a gold standard because it is not only therapeutic, uh, diagnostic but therapeutic also and we can diagnose so many other conditions but it is, it may not be as a primary method. There are patients who will be subjected like you saw in the study who will need laparoscopy eventually but of course there are a, there is a group which can be benefited just by HSG. Uh, what I want to know is what is uh, new or original work in this. We all know that HSG has definitely some advantages over laparoscopy such the as The originality cost is, uh, it's not an original thing but I just want to say that we should not replace uh, H laparoscopy as a first line of treatment. So that is the title of my study, that where the trend is, there is rising trend of offering only laparoscopy Hello. as a first line and the only treatment, uh, diagnostic modality. So my study was to say and prove that that is not the case. Because the title says that should laparoscopy totally replace? Totally replace. So okay. HSD should be obsolete or not done. Okay. That is it. Sir, in fact, I mean, it's so good that uh, Lena is presenting this because from ISAR platform, I have heard that now IVF consultants don't even do laparoscopy. They just want to do a hysteroscopy and finish it off. From ISAR platform, I have heard this, that there's no role of laparoscopy also. Just do a hysteroscopy and do an embryo transfer, that's good enough. You know, so it's so good that, you know, somebody is talking about HSD. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Lena Patankar, ma'am, for a nice presentation.
Now I will request our respected judges, Dr. Salil Barsode, to felicitate Dr. Lina Patankar, ma'am. We have here Dr. Babita Misar, ma'am. She has done MBBS DGO and she is consultant at Misar Hospital, Amravati. She will be judging for the next two sessions. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shirish Farke, sir, for judging the first session. Thank you. Participant will be Dr. Manisha Barmade. She will present different cases of scar endometriosis and she is from Latur. Good morning, everyone. My presentation is different cases of scar endometriosis. <coughs> scar endometriosis is a rare occurrence. Presence of endometrium at ectopic sites other than the uterine cavity. Though common sites of endometriosis are pelvic structures. Extra pelvic endometriosis is, com is occasionally seen. This case report describes two cases of a scar endometriosis. First case shows scar endometriosis after laptotomy and second case is after the two LSS cases. Introduction. Endometriosis of the abdominal wall following a caesarean section or hysterectomy is a rare event. These cases reported with a scar endometriosis of a rectus abdominis muscle, subcutaneous tissue involving all the abdominal wall layers. These cases are reported of a financial incisions. First case, 30 years of a female, para 2 living to 1 abortion, history of a laparotomy done after, uh, for failed 12 weeks abortion 2 years back, history details were not available, she had previous 2 full, full term normal deliveries, 2 girls corresponding ages 8 years and 5 years, patient complained of a dysmenorrhea, lump in abdomen on right lower side since 2 years, severe pain in lump during the menstruation, tubal ligation was not done, she took OC pills for 6 months, ultrasonography shows 25 by 13 mm and 15 by 7 mm size subcutaneous lesions and intramuscular regions respectively. Signs of scar endometriosis. MRI pelvis confirmed the findings. On examination, pulse rate, BP, per abdomen, PS findings are also normal. Cervix, uh, per vagina uterus is also normal. Local examination shows 3 by 3 cm swelling fixed to the scar, tenderness present. Patient posted for laparotomy for scar endometriosis. Skin incision around scar endometriosis taken. Skin, subcutaneous tissue, rectus sheath open. Endometrium are freed from the rectus sheath and peritoneum. Uh, scar endometric tissue excise sent for the HPR. Hemostasis achieved. Patient withstood the procedure well and discharged on the seventh day. Histopathological study confirmed the endometrial tissue in excise specimen. Diagnosis 2MG for 3 months prescribed for the patient. Patient will come for follow-up. This is the report of a sonography which shows the scar endometriosis. These are the some operating findings. The endometrium are freed from the rectus sheath, peritoneum, uh, rectus muscle, uh, hemostatic suture stake. Specimen is excited and sent for the HPR which confirming the scar endometriosis report. Now the case 2, 32 year lady previous to LSS, uh, previous to LSS with 6 year female child with 1 IUD complaining of a severe dysmenorrhea, she was admitted for pain in abdomen, UHG done which shows 4 by 3 cm scar endometriosis on examination, pulse rate, BP, everything is normal, per abdomen tendon is present over lower abdomen, per, per vaginal examination shows uterine movements are tender. Hemogram was normal. Patient posted for laparotomy for scar endometriosis. The MRI pelvis done for the confirmation of report, which shows the same report. Skin incision around the scar endometriosis taken. Skin, subcutaneous tissue, rectus sheath open, abdomen open, scar endometric nodule removed from the uterus, nodules removed from the peritoneum and bladder. Buttressing stitch with 2-0 vicryl on serosa bladder took. Hemostasis achieved, abdomen closing layer. Tissue sent for HPR, patient withstood the procedure well, discharge on the day 7, injection luproid depot 3.75 mg every 28 days for 3 months, advice to the patient. These are the report, uh, we show the scar endometriosis on USG, this is our operative finding, the endometrioma is added into the uterus, uh, rec peritoneum, rectus muscle, subcutaneous tissue and just the margins, uh, the uh, endometrioma is also attached to the bladder serosa also. Now the discussion. The mechanism of histogenesis was initially described by the Samson in his implantation theory in 1868. 
This theory suggests that endometriosis result from reflex of the viable endometrial tissue through the fallopian tube and implant on the parietal and pelvic organ. In this case, iatrogenic implantation of endometrial tissue into the abdominal wall structure is probable, so, uh, pr probable source of a scar endometriosis. The first case is a laparotomy and the second case is a two previous two LSS scar. Uh, the patient of endometriosis always complain of a pain, pain swelling at the incision site and may be prominent during the menstrual cycle. The swelling may be present even after even um, woman was not menstruating. The size of the swelling and intensity of pain during menstruation was noticed by the patient. For uh, the examination of the swelling is occasionally altered brownish or roots can be expressed from the mass. If such sign can be elicited, it is a sure sign of a scar endometriosis. The caesarean scar endometriosis is a rare form of extrapelvic endometriosis. Deposit of endometrial gland, stromal cells, subcutaneous tissue, dermis of the skin, sheath, rectus muscle, intraperitoneal or, or in the uterine myometrium. These are the common, the, the, where the deposits of the endometrial glands are placed. Just a few more slides. The differential diagnosis of a scar endometriosis, it is a difficult to, uh, it is a rare and very difficult to diagnose because it is a uh, differential diagnosis of stitch granuloma, pyogenic granuloma, incisional hernia, lipoma, dermatofibroma. The prevention is only by the uh, using different mops uh, for, for intra-abdominally and the subcutaneous tissue, discard the uh, swabs or any uh, sutures which are using for the uh, for the uterine incision, which should not be used for the subcutaneous tissue or the muscle. The, uh, the, uh, the management for the uh, scar endometriosis are two. A medical line, one medical line, line of management and another, another is a surgical line of management. Medical line of management, if fail, then we have to go for the surgical. But uh, it is recommended that the surgical line of management, surgically the scar endometrioma is removed is the better option instead for the me uh, me medical. Medical line of management, we can use them. Uh, OC pills, GNH RH analog, uh, and the progesterones. Uh, the, for the uh, surgical scar, we have to remove the one centimeter wide scar from uh, uh, one centimeter uh, wide uh, uh, for the endometriotic border, and the uh, <coughs> follow-up uh, we have to given the um, uh, either go for, either we have to go for the diagnosis or for the GNH RH analog to avoid the recurrence. Uh, <coughs> so this case is a difficult to diagnose because sometimes features are not present. Uh, so we have to uh, just uh, uh, the main line of management for this is a uh, <coughs> ultrasound guided FNSC, which will be suggested whether it is an endometriosis. Sometimes this condition can be confused with the uh, malignancy condition or uh, ma'am your time is up yes. How? yes did you follow them for uh, recurrence later on uh, madam the cases of recurrence are common and we were to counseling about the recurrence so did uh, you find any recurrence in these patients yes ma'am it was there it was ma'am okay how did you manage them last three months also, okay so they are not only coming for follow up madam Okay, thank you. Okay, ma'am. Uh, you have said that uh, surgical option is better than medical treatment, but you have not quoted any references for that. Uh, sir, according to ASRM, it is recommended that it is for the pain or any having complaint, we have to go for the surgical line of management. And medical line, is, is line, line of management is only used for the, uh, to avoid the effect of a hormones on the site. Thank you. The next uh, would be Dr. Pooja Loda. Her presentation is on maternal and fetal outcome in women with low PAPPA. She is from Pune. Good morning, everybody, respected judges and dear friends. Today I'm here to present maternal and fetal outcomes in women with low PAPPA looking beyond chromosomal abnormalities. The aims and objectives of this study was to study the maternal and fetal outcomes in women with low PAPE, comparisons of outcomes within subgroups of low PAPE, and to propose a simplified algorithm for surveillance and management of women with low PAPE. Now, why this study? Why was this study thought of? 
What we already know about this topic is that yes, low PAPE is looking beyond the aneuploidies and it is associated with adverse outcomes like fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia. Now what new is this study adding? Very quickly, the pyramid of antenatal care has actually inverted in the last two decades and from multiple irrational visits in the third trimester, we've now come on to very specific series of routine visits to a more individualized patient-specific approach and less number of visits in the third trimester than in the first and second trimester. And how has this been possible? That's because we've made the most of this 12 weeks window of opportunity where we do all of this and today my topic is on what is double marker, one of the elements is PAPE. We know that there are bigger and more important problems than chromosomal abnormalities and if we look at any NICU, we see that there are more number of babies dying of because of low birth weight rather than dying of chromosomal abnormalities. And why is prediction of bad obstetric outcomes required? Because India, Asia contributes to 75% of fetal growth restricted infants in the world. The prevalence of fetal growth restriction in India is as high as 40%. Preeclampsia, 5 to 8% in the world versus 56% in India. So here we see how hugely these two obstetrical problems have an impact on our perinatal outcomes. If we screen for preeclampsia only using the history, we screen only 30% of women. But if we add on PAPE and uterine artery parsitality, let us see how the pickup of the problems increases. Coming back to the materials and methods of the study, the study was conducted from January 2014 to 2018 in the Department of Fetal Medicine and Fetal Therapy at the Kangaroo Cradle Fetal Care Clinic, Department of Obskaini Ruby Hall Clinic, Pune, and Bharti Vidya Peet University, Pune. Women who attended the first trimester screening clinic between 11 and 13 plus 6 weeks scan underwent a scan and a double marker. They were counseled and scanned by a single Fetal Medicine Foundation accredited sonographer on the same series of machine, which is me. Double marker was done at a Fetal Medicine Foundation accredited lab with uniform software. The exclusion criteria were chromosomal abnormalities, structural defects, pre-existing maternal comorbidities, multifetal gestations, vanishing gestations, active bleeding within a week of double marker test. The total study population was 2,240, out of which 305 women, which is approximately 13.6%, had a low PAPE of less than 0.4 moms. This was the group A. The group B had normal PAPE moms, which is more than 0.4 multiples of medians, and that contributed to 86.3%. Primary outcomes studied were fetal growth restriction with normal Dopplers, fetal growth restriction with abnormal Dopplers, early preeclampsia, late preeclampsia, unexplained oligohydramnios without maternal preeclampsia and without fetal growth restriction. So everything else is fine. There is isolated unexplained oligohydramnios. The statistical analysis, the p-value was considered significant if it was less than 0.05. Coming to the demographics, they were comparable in both the groups in terms of age, BMI and the gravida status. Now when we see fetal growth restriction with normal Dopplers, we see that there were almost equal number of women in both the groups, that is group with low PAPE and normal PAPE. Whereas if we see fetal growth restriction with abnormal Dopplers, we see there is a huge rise in the number of women who had low PAPE as compared to those who had a normal PAPE. Also, if we compare early preeclampsia, which means preeclampsia whose onset is before 34 weeks, the women in group A with low PAPE had a much higher incidence of early preeclampsia as compared to the women with normal PAPE. Late, late preeclampsia cases were comparable in both the groups. Unexplained oligohydramnios was surprisingly and interestingly found only in group A and not in group B. So looking at the numbers, here we see that if we compare low PAPE women with a woman with normal PAPE, the p-values were significant for fetal growth restriction with abnormal Dopplers and early preeclampsia. These were the only two groups which showed a p-value significant. All other and unexplained oligohydramnios because there was no case in the normal PAPE which showed unexplained oligohydramnios. So, considering the odds ratio and the p-value, we know that FGR with abnormal Dopplers and early preeclampsia were with increased incidence in group A, which is women with PAPE less than 0 
Now what is already known about this study is that yes, low PAPE is ominous not just for Down syndrome but for all these adverse maternal outcomes. But what new this study has tried to add is that there was within the group of low PAPE, what can it predict better than the other so that interventions are more useful and you apply it to a smaller subset of people. So PAPE is a stronger predictor for fetal growth restriction with abnormal Dopplers and not just for small for gestational age fetuses. Also, it predicted early preeclampsia and not the late preeclampsia as well. So to conclude, PAPE has enabled prediction of two most deadly obstetric syndromes, which is fetal growth restriction and preeclampsia. Within a subset of small fetuses, PAPE identifies the sick small fetus and not the happy small fetus. Within a subset of preeclamptic women, PAPE identifies more morbid early preeclampsia, much more difficult to manage than the late one, as compared to the forgiving late preeclampsia. Within a subset of, sorry, aspirin, the savior drug, acts better to prevent fetal growth restriction with abnormal Dopplers and early preeclampsia, hence reducing the false positive rate and making the screening process much more effective. How does this study translate into clinical practice? Yes, starting aspirin and or LMWH depending on the history and the other factors in the woman. This is enabled from 12 weeks itself to cover both the waves of placentation rather than predict predicting it later in the second trimester. Also, you can put this into a high risk and a more surveillance group and call them for an early growth scan at 26 to 28 weeks. So increased surveillance, monitoring, empirical preventive therapy in women with low PAPE shall improve beneficial in timing and improving short and long-term perinatal outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. You have compared Dopplers along with PAPE, you said, no? but what Doppler you have not mentioned and what... Sorry? Which Doppler you are talking okay, so, about that uh, you have not mentioned? Yeah, the study has been conducted on the basis of aspirate trial where this whole thing started. Uh, it has called fetal, uh, I've mentioned on one of the slides, it has defined fetal growth restriction as fetuses who were growing less than 10 centile for the gestation. Abnormal Dopplers were defined as umbilical artery PI more than 95th centile and or MCA less than 5th centile. So these were the standard and, uh, definitions. you've taken MOM as 0.4. Yes, sir. But uh, I think it's 0.5 cutoff. Yes, sir. So there was a lot of debate when it started that low PAPE is associated with adverse outcomes. 0.5 was the cutoff used. Uh, 0.5 came from the Western world where the incidence of preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction is not as high as in India. So Indian subgroups started realizing that we are putting a lot more number of women into this high risk category. and scaring them off and starting aspirin too liberally. So they cut down, they brought down the cutoff to 0 0.4 to find the actual number to increase the specificity of this whole situation and therefore the cutoff was brought down to 0 0.4. So 0 0.4 works better in our population as compared to the western world. You have not quoted any references for this. Uh, I should have listened, sir, it's aspirate trial which started in 2013 and… As far as MOM is concerned, 0 0.5 and 0 0.4. Okay, yeah. so multiple studies, relatively a new topic, last five years it has been studied. It started with 0 0.5 in ASPRAY and a lot of groups are now coming down to 0 0.4. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank yes, you sir. very much. Ma'am, I excluded them because uh, as you rightly said, the twins will have an effect on the PAPE. So twins reduce the PAPE moms and it would have confounded my study, so I excluded them. Uh, I just want to know the, uh, what is the sensitivity of uh, only Doppler test at, just, at this gestational age and how the PAPE increases the sensitivity of the combining both the tests. Uh, you mean, sir, uterine artery Doppler? Yeah, it is not in this study, but uh, I've done that three years back. If you combine, if you do only uterine artery PI, take a cutoff of 2.8 mean PI at 12 weeks, the sensitivity of picking up early preeclampsia is around 60%. If you add on Doppler, it increase, increases to 78, 78 to 80%. So you still have 20% which you will not diagnose. Uh, adding a PAP-8 test, yes. how much the sensitivity 20 increase? 20% increase. Just a 20%. And we are anyways doing the double marker for everybody for a chromosomal abnormality. So we can overuse it for this as well. Uh, I just want to ask one question not related to this study. Uh, why are we doing NT scan in between 11 to 13 plus 6? 
Uh, so, sir, it has been found, NT started in 1991 with Professor Nicolaides and uh, nuchal translucency he observed is increased in abnormal fetuses in that phase because the hemodynamics of the fetus changes between 11 to 13 weeks after placentation happens in such a way that if there is an abnormality, it will show increased nuchal fold. And therefore, he chose that gestational age and we've been following it up and all this has added on since then. Does it have anything to do with lymphatics? Yes, sir. So the abnormalities is basically lymphatics. The reason why the NT increase is lymphatics. And once the placentation happens, the baby actively starts producing lymph. And if there is an abnormality, it will show up at only this gestation. In fact, later, even abnormal fetuses, which were abnormal between 11 and 13, will start becoming normal after 13 weeks. So he chose that period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will uh, request uh, Dr. Pooja Lodha, ma'am, to stay on the... Uh, stage and I will request Dr. Babita Misar ma'am to felicitate Dr. Pooja Lodha ma'am. Thank you all respected judges and thank you all participants.